This morning we're going to continue on with our series called Being RCC, in which we're cultivating a biblically formed culture. And as we enter into that, uh, good news, this week my family and I were able to get away on a little vacation, and we went to San Diego, and we visited the San Diego Zoo for the first time ever. I've always wanted to go, and we got to go, and it did not disappoint if you've ever been there, there's a, or if you haven't been there, here's my suggestion, what we did. You get on this double-decker bus at first, and they drive you around the whole park, and the tour guy kind of explains some things about the animals, about the park, about what they're doing. It's really cool. And here's the thing. As we're going by the koalas, he said something that I cannot get out of my mind. Okay. He told us, first of all, I don't know if you knew this, but koalas are not bears. I always called them koala bears. He's like, they're not bears. There's no such thing as a koala bear. They're marsupials. Okay, cool, right? That's not the cool thing. <laughs> then he said that the male koalas, who are so cute and cuddly, that's why we call them bears, right? They're little cute little tutty bears, right? Koala marsupials, right? And, and he said the male koalas are incredibly aggressive, and so they have to have their own habitat with their own tree. And they learned this the hard way. They said, if you put two male koalas in the same habitat and they have to share the same tree, every single time they quickly get into a fight. And before long, one of the koala bears tosses the other koala bear out of the tree like WWE wrestling match. <laughs> and... I cannot get this out of my head. It is now very high up on my bucket list. Before I die, I would love to see two koala males in the same tree and see one of them toss the other one out of the tree. And I totally understand that that is not a cool desire. <laughs> this is probably what the early church father, uh, Augustine of Hippo, called a disordered desire, right? That's how he described sin, as a disordered desire. And nonetheless, I still have it. Now, here's the thing. In my dream of seeing a koala flung out of a tree, in my dream, there's a safety net. And the koala lands in there, and so no koalas will be injured in the fulfillment of my bucket list. Now, the reason why I offer this confession, if you will, this morning is because I think it illustrates a broader issue that I truly want us to discuss this morning. As we think about who we want to be as a church, what kind of culture is the Bible going to form us into as a church? Uh, and first of all, just where does this disordered desire, if you will, come from that we often call, we could call, us versus themism, right? Us versus themism is a major theme in the Bible, and I think we all would agree it is a major theme in our society that we would call, some would call, a, a, a culture of contempt, a culture where divisiveness is the waters that we swim in. We all are formed to kind of see ourselves as a part of an us. And we also are formed to see some people as the them. There's us versus themism. And why, why does that happen? And is that good or is that bad? And if it is a disordered desire what will we do about it? And it's certainly not new. We'll call it us versus themism is not a new thing. Think about some of the famous us versus them categories in, in our world, right? How many of you guys have heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys? The Hatfields and the McCoys from 1863 to 1891 in the West Virginia, Kentucky region, became this famous 
family feud. Lots of people killed over this hate. The Hatfields hated the McCoys. The McCoys hated the Hatfields. There's a Netflix special, a documentary about it. It's interesting in a weird and sick way, kind of like flinging koalas out of a tree, right? And there's famous fictional us versus them that we all kind of are aware of, right? How, how many of you guys know the Sharks and the Jets, right? Oh, right, the West Side Story. It's inspired by Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I don't know if you knew that. In my childhood, growing up in the 80s and 90s, remember the L.A. street gangs, right? Don't wear blue if you're a Dodger fan, right? You can't wear blue in certain neighborhoods because there's the Bloods and the Crips, right? And this is an us versus them. And in Jesus' day, in the setting that the New Testament is written in, there's the Greeks versus the barbarians. If you were Greek, everyone who wasn't Greek, the way that the derogatory term for, everyone, for the them is they're barbarians. For the Jews, what was it? The Gentiles or the uncircumcised. This goes way, way back. Paul actually does this fun kind of wordplay on this idea of the Greeks and the barbarians and the Jews and the Gentiles as he just intermixes them throughout his letter in the Romans to where he's kind of making this point like if we're going to come together in Christ and be a church, then we can't see each other that way anymore. We're all one in Christ in Romans. And I think it's important for us, though, to ask, who are the Hatfields in our hearts? And who are the McCoys? Right? Who are the, who are the Sharks and the Jets? Who are the Barbarians to us? Who are the Gentiles in our hearts? Do we have personal enemies? As I sit before the Lord with the Holy Spirit and pray, especially this week over this message, I have some that I need to deal with. Personal enemies. I just, like, if I were to see them at Costco, it's like makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to see them. I don't want to think about them. I don't want to hear about them. I don't want someone to post about them, especially not in a way that makes them look good. Right? Then there's political enemies, right? Social enemies, groups we just despise, groups we think they're the them, they're the problem. And what I want want to speak into our community this morning by way of trying to cultivate a biblically formed culture is that the gospel of Jesus should be transforming our hearts and our minds And we should actually be, because of the gospel, people who are creating a culture in our hearts, in our minds, in our church, of us for them. Us for them. And so this morning, our our topic for being RCC is we want to be a church that sees the world through the lenses of it is us for them. Rich Veloto says this great quote. He goes, it's really a curious evangelism strategy to despise the people you are trying to convert to Jesus, right? <laughs> to see them as the them, the, the uncircumcised, the barbarian, makes no sense to Paul, as we'll see, and I think to Jesus, if our mission is to reach them for Christ. In fact, I'd say the gospel is the greatest leveling ground in the cosmos. And by cosmos, I mean everything that God created and ordered it the way that God wanted it to be. The gospel that Jesus died for sinners, which Paul says he's the foremost. And I would argue with Paul, no, I'm the foremost. We should probably all argue with Paul, no, I'm the foremost. It's the greatest leveling ground on the cosmos, because none of us bring anything to the cross of value or worth that we can use to earn God's salvation. We're all just leveled. Michael Gorman came up with this term that I think describes this. He calls it cruciformity, being formed by the cross. 
And the idea here is to come to the cross, to empty ourselves there, and receive a newness that transforms us into Christ likeness. And I would argue that what it's going to do is it's going to teach us that the gospel, the true gospel, the power of the gospel creates in us from the cross where we're emptied to, to where we're inspired by the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit back into the world to passionately point people to Jesus, we need to put on the us versus them lenses. Gee, we, we had nothing. We were against God. We were enemies. And while we were enemies of, of Jesus, he died for us. So when we see people who don't yet get it in our own minds or in, the, in, 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 in line with the scripture, which isn't always the same thing, we should admit, we shouldn't see them as our enemy. We should see them as our mission, as our friend that we want to passionately point to Jesus. And so with that, I want to invite you to stand as we read God's word. And our text today is going to be from Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Now we're going to read a large chunk to get the context, and it's going to be a lot, so just go ahead and, and let it me read over you, and then we're going to hone in on a smaller chunk of it, and so it will be a lot more manageable, I promise. This is God's word. So then, Remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised, by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one, and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that he might, make, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. This is God's word, and you may be seated. As I said, this is a lot, this is a lot to take in. For context, I want us to read over this broader context of the letter. Hopefully you got kind of the, the general idea here. But I would say that the key verse I want us to pay attention to, or one of the key verses, is this verse 14. He says, For he is our peace, who made both groups one. And tore down the dividing wall of hostility. What are the both groups? Specifically, the context is the uncircumcised are the Gentiles, the not Jews. The circumcised are the Jews. But I want us to see that's just their us versus them. I think you can interject in here and contextualize all kinds of us versus thems, right? And he wants to take the both groups, the us and the them, and he wants to tear down a dividing wall. And the way that he wants to do that is by bringing them all to the cross, which is going to level the ground. And now you become one together in Christ. What he calls a new man, he's not talking about an individual man, he's talking about 
a hu- the humanity. It's a new humanity, a new way of being human. So we, we read and we hone in on this verse and we clearly see, I think, that the gospel breaks down barriers and it unites people of different backgrounds, cultures, and even political viewpoints into what Scott McKnight, a great theologian, calls in a book he wrote, the fellowship of difference. Difference meaning different people. And he writes that this in the context of, of like the Corinthian church or the Roman church or the church in Ephesus, noting that one of their small group churches, it would have been smaller than our church, right? We're, we're a big church for first century, right? And they would have met in these houses and it wouldn't have been uncommon for you to have like a Roman soldier and a, and a, and a, a formerly like Jewish Pharisee and like a woman who used to be a prostitute and all different types of like socioeconomic groups, age groups, backgrounds, they wouldn't have thought the same in a lot of ways. And yet they all have to come together and learn about Jesus and relearn how to be human together. And so Paul is kind of saying the gospel transforms us from wherever we come from more and more into Jesus. And yet along the way, we're all in process. And so we need to just make space for us all to grow into Christness together rather than divide up and, and in the middle of the process, like, like just close off the process. I'm not going to be a part of your process. I just want to be around people that are like me, right? This is us versus themism. And note in our text, Paul states that Jesus brings peace. The Hebrew word, the concept is probably familiar to all of us, this idea of shalom, right? He brings peace, shalom, which is a picture of what it would have been like in the Garden of Eden, right? Shalom is this holistic, when, when everything is running the way God ordered it to be. That's shalom. The way, things, the way things God intended for it to be is this idea of shalom. And what he puts to death is this idea of hostility, Paul uses, right? And this goes back to a word, Hamas, which is, Completely different than what you hear in the, in, 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 in the, in the news today. This isn't the same idea. The, the Hamas that we see in the news today is an acronym. This is a Hebrew word. They're not the same thing. And yet this word Hamas that, that, that Paul is referring to, that he puts to death, it, it goes way back into the biblical story. And so Paul is actually in this text sending us back on a journey to get on a little bus tour and not go through the San Diego Zoo, but go back and kind of remember what happened in the origin story that Moses presents to us, particularly in Genesis 1 through 11, where us versus themism gets birthed. Adam and Eve in the garden, they lived with God, and there was shalom. This was the way God had intended it to be. And we know that from the biblical text that Adam and Eve are given this mission or given this vocation, this purpose of being what theologians would call a vice regent. A regent is simply a term for a governing authority that that rules over an area, but they rule over an area with a greater governing authority that sends them there, right? So think of Jesus's day. The Roman Empire rules everything, and yet the area of Judea, there was a, there was a, a Jewish king, right? Herod. Herod was a vice regent. He was a regent or a king that was assigned by the Roman Empire. He wasn't really the main authority. They were. He just ruled with some authority. And so when God says, you guys are to, to, to have dominion and rule over the fish and all this stuff, he's saying, I'm the king, and yet I've given you authority or vocation to rule as vice regents. And we see that as vice regents, they were supposed to rule 
and take care of in a way that looked like this. Us for each other. Us for the good of everybody and all of creation. It was us for them in the garden. That was the idea. And then we see that when sin comes in, right, when they eat from the infamous fruit, Adam and Eve sin. And the the idea in the Bible is that you will then know good and evil. Think about it. They already knew good really well. So what is introduced? Just evil. And we see this downward spiral clearly seen in the Bible because they reject God's shalom and God as king, and they kind of just do things their own way and their, what, what, what was pleasing in their own eyes. And we see right away, Adam blames Eve. The woman you gave me, right? It's her fault. Eve blames the serpent. Both of them are blaming God, right? Like you gave her to me. Like, would you, you know, it's all God's fault, right? Then they give birth to Cain and Abel. And Cain murders Abel. There's this hostility. Brothers are supposed to look out for one another. Now a brother murders a brother. And then we get to the flood story. It says God looks out at what, what had happened all over. And it says that the earth was filled with this Hamas. This hostility is a, is a good way of translating that. It's what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 2. He looks out and he sees hostility everywhere. Us versus themism everywhere. There's no longer anybody who's like, it's us for you. It's just power over you. Get, get my way. Do it my way. And he's grieved that he made it, it says. And then we see the Tower of Babel. And basically what you see is these humans decide to do what's right in their own eyes. And they build this kind of tower to heaven. And it's very clear that they don't want anything to do with God. It's a godless effort to, to make things better. It's what we would call in our, in our, in our modern vernacular, uh, secular humanism, right? All seen in Genesis 1 through 11. Now I want you to see how Paul is following this storyline in his letter to the Ephesian church. He says, for he, Jesus, is our peace, our shalom, like we saw in Eden, who made both groups one and tore down the Hamas, the dividing uh, wall of hostility. Jesus has intervened to restore Eden-like peace and reverse the curse that ended up looking like this hostility. That was the fruit of the curse. And so a big part of why Jesus came and what the Bible actually calls salvation, which biblically is more than our westernized view of seeing everything through an individualism lens, salvation for me, salvation includes salvation for us, but it's a much bigger and beautiful picture in the scriptures where God is actually healing all of his creation. He's healing, he's restoring things. His plan is to restore things back to the garden where shalom reigns. Where evil and sin has been removed and God's way perfectly has been restored. This new humanity, this new heavens and the new earth it talks about at the end of Revelation. And so salvation looks like God coming and saving, yes, individuals and families and communities and and his kingdom ethics spreading, right? And the salvation begins to be a blessing to the whole earth, right? Where, where we, we create a new way of being human. We model as the church a new way of being human. Where we're us for them. And the whole world is caught up in us versus them hostility. We recognize that in Christ that's been put to death. 
And we are called to a different way of seeing things. A different way of seeing people. A different way of handling hurt, brokenness, disagreement, right? A different way. And so the work of the gospel, it requires us to put to death us versus themism. And it requires us to be transformed to a new way, which is us for ism, which is what Adam and Eve were called to do. Our vocation is being restored. A new purpose, a new vocation, a new reason for being here, a new way of being here, a new way of being with each other here, a new way of handling people who don't like you, a new way of handling people who don't agree with you, who annoy you, who make you frustrated, who you think are nuts, who you think get it all wrong. And they might get it all wrong. That's not the point. The point is, how are you going to treat them? How are you going to view them? Will there be hostility towards them? Or will there be compassion for them? Paul describes this as two becoming one so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. When he says one new man, in the Greek particularly, this, the idea of man is not one individual man. This is mankind or humanity. Scott, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, John Stott was the one that I first learned this term, this idea of a new humanity. Ephesians is talking about this, us becoming a new humanity. Simply, it's not secular humanism. Secular humanism is us building something without God. It's a new humanity in Christ. It's us figuring out a new way of being human together with Jesus as our king with Jesus as the center, with, with Jesus as the king, and us taking the responsibility, the vocation of, of, of ruling under his authority. Not ruling over people, right? Using our power, using our gifts, using everything we have been given in, a, in every way that we can, not to get our way, but to bless others and to passionately point them to Jesus. The work of the gospel will put us versus them attitudes to death. It has to. Think of all of the people that Jesus was expected to be against. The Samaritans, right? Right? Think of the Samaritan woman. You think of one after another, all of these people that, that Jesus surprisingly offers friendship to, service to. I mean, some of the people that Jesus healed, the, 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 the thing that would have been shocking to most of the Jews was, why would you heal them? They're not us. I thought the Messiah was going to come fix us. You're fixing them? Right? So Jesus is just modeling this completely new way of being human. Where the two, whatever those two are, are now seen as the one. Like, you're not a them. I want you to be an us. And while you remain a them, well, I'm going to be for you not versus you. And when you see this as a me versus you, I'm not going to reciprocate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat it like it's us for. And think about Jesus on the cross. It was for sure them versus Jesus on the cross. And what was his response? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's me for them. I'm doing this for them. 
Paul describes this as the two becoming one. And he calls this kind of a new way of being human together, a new man or a new human or a new humanity, new way of being human. And this is not the same as secular humanism. And all through the scriptures, we actually see people kind of take on this, do what's right in my own eyes. That's not what this is about. We don't form our new humanity for us all doing what's right in our own eyes. But what is right in Jesus' eyes is our pursuit. So for, so us for them, I think this is important. Us for them does not mean compromise God's word or God's will. Us for them doesn't mean, well, I just won't care about my convictions. And us for them, it means that your enemy is not the other people who don't see it the way that you see it. Or even who treat you in a way of an enemy. Those people are our mission. Those people are the ones that Christ wants to reach through us. And if Jesus could handle them crucifying him and them him still being for them, we should be able to learn how to handle the world crucifying us or persecuting us or disagreeing with us or hating us and not reciprocate with defensiveness and, and, and creating these walls of hostility. And it is hard. It requires the Holy Spirit, which he does give to us. It requires requires us to regularly be reminding ourselves of this, especially in a world where we're just saturated and called into, and the world is trying to form us into us versus themism, and we need to reject it for the gospel. Us versus them means that those people are the people we are trying to passionately point to Jesus. So why would we despise them, right? Rich Veloto says. Hating them, despising them, building walls of hostility in our hearts and minds and churches is not a gospel strategy for reaching those who Paul says are far off from God. It's not us for them at the expense of God and believing God's way is the best way, right? It's not saying at the expense of just laying down my convictions for the us for, uh, uh, for them uh, uh, mission. Us for them, it's us for them in a way that points people to the way that we live for God in a way that, that shows his goodness to them, right? If, if you, if you uh, uh, hit me on this cheek, I'll turn the other cheek. Why would you do that, Right? If you steal my, 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 my shirt, I'll give you my jacket too. Why would you do that? Right? Why? Like Peter goes, live in a way that people are going to be seeing the hope that you have and how it's changing the way you live so much that they start asking questions about that hope that is making you different. It's making you weird in a good way. Us for themism. So Paul's vision, I would argue, Paul's vision in Ephesians 2, 11 through 12, they're profound and it's practical. And here's what I think he calls us to. He calls us to three things. He calls us to recognize us versus them attitudes in ourselves. If you think you don't have any us versus them attitude, I would invite you this morning to ask the Holy Spirit to show you yours. I have many. I need to enter into this work. We all need to enter into this work. We need to identify where we have allowed hate of others, divisive perspectives, like I'm in this group and they're in that group. We need to just recognize it, that that's there is my point. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them doesn't mean that they're not wrong and you're not right. It just means, is that really the most important thing to you? Being right, figuring out who's right and wrong, right? Like, where is that going to go? How is that, how is that win anyone to Christ? 
whether between the groups of individuals. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I have three people that I wrote down and I don't want to go reconcile with that I need to make a coffee meeting with and have a, like a hard conversation with. A, a humble conversation. I still think all three of them are wrong. It's the nicest way I could say it. And, and that's wrong. The, what I've allowed to happen in my heart because of that, it, it needs to get dealt with. Does that make sense? And there's groups for sure. All kinds of groups. And so we need to bring these attitudes to the cross. That's my point. That's the only way we can deal with it, right? Oh, we're all right. These are up here. Just imagine. Use your imagination. I'm good. I'm good, Kiana. Uh, uh, Bring these attitudes to the cross. Through the crucifixion of Christ, we're invited to transform our hearts and minds. And I would argue, I would exhort us that the gospel calls us to lay down this hate, this prejudice, if it's prejudice, this pride. I think I'm better than you. I just assume that I'm right all the time. I don't even want to even explore the reality that I might be wrong about anything, that you might have some good points, because I've already labeled you and canceled you, right? I want to lay that at the cross and let the gospel transform me so that when I'm walking around, I just don't have hate. I have compassion to passionately point people to Jesus and then to embrace new life in Christ what Paul refers to as a new way of being human in Christ, where there are no longer two, us versus them. We just don't see it that way. It's just us for them. It's me for you. I'd love it to be you for me too. But even if you're not a you for me person, I'm a us, me for you person. Because that's what Jesus taught me to live. When we partake of communion every single Sunday, we do it here. It says, Paul says in in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, and whenever you take communion, whenever you you, you remember God's, Jesus' body that was broken for you, his blood that was spilt for you, whenever you do that, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. Why is that important? Because Jesus died to remove the hostility between us and to bring peace. Peace between me and God. And I'm going to try to live at peace with you because I want you to have peace with God. I want to be at peace. So there's, there's this remember Jesus' death. And one of the ways we need to do that is by regularly coming to the cross and letting it level us again. Letting us just humble us again. There's one thing that I know for sure every human has in common that makes us a one. We all need Jesus. I need Jesus. And you need Jesus. And they need Jesus. And that is the most important thing to build my life on. Amen? So when I come to the cross, I just rem- I just remind it, right? And it's so interesting. In 1 Corinthians 11, it's like there's problems going on in the church in Corinth. Like the rich people are showing up early. They're taking the best food. They're getting drunk as a skunk. And then the, the people who had to work all day for them so they could be rich come in later, get less. Paul's like, examine what you guys are doing. This isn't communion. This isn't common union. This doesn't reflect that you all have a common union in Christ. This does not reflect that you've all been leveled by the cross. You've allowed society out there to come and reform the way you're doing church here? No. No. You need to just level all of that. This should look different. Amen? Like, so there's this idea of, of embracing a new life in Christ by coming to the cross. And the first thing we need to do is recognize, though, need to recognize us versus themism. In the historical context in Ephesus, 
The division was between Jews and Gentiles. In, in, when, it, when he started getting farther out, like when, he's, when Paul's talking to the church in Rome, it was also Greek and barbarian. For me, I've recognized at the fire department, there's like this generational hostility. There's the old guys and the, and the young guys. Now here's the thing. When I was one of the young guys, the old guys thought they were better than me and us. There was an us versus themism. Now I've become an old guy and I see the young. It's like it's just this reciprocal thing. I'm right though. Like we're the like there there is some no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and there's workplace divides in the fire department. Like there's us doing the work and then management. They don't get it, right? common thing is all those chiefs, they just sit there with a donut in one hand and a dumb idea in the other until one of them gets done with their donut and lands an idea, and then we have to deal with it, right? <laughs> Denominational differences. Our church gets it. Pff, all them, they're, they're watered down, right? They don't get it. Political factions, right? The conservatives are the problem, right? The liberals are the problem. <laughs> Right. There's socioeconomic issues, right? It was happening in the early church, like the rich versus the poor. That we were raised here, you're a foreigner, right? Like, you know, I'm not from San Pedro. I mean, I know what Stavros is, but I don't know one of the t-shirts, right? So, like, we're from here, right? So there's, there's all these dividing walls. And the question is, why does this happen? How can we be aware of it more? And there's actually a bunch of science and help that helps us figure this out. And here's just some interesting things. If you guys ever get a chance to read this book, The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, it's incredibly brilliant. These two work in, and have worked in the last like uh, uh, 20 to 30 years in, in college settings. And they're recognizing just how... College kids these days are, are doing this device, divisiveness, right? Like protest because, you know, a, a Republican comes to speak and they don't agree with them and they protest, you know, and, and block off and do all these things and kind of justify it and all these different things. On the other side, the, the, the conservatives like, oh, we can't have a liberal person come here and speak, right? And so, so he's like, well, what's going on here? How do we dissect this? And they dissect it down to three myths that have come in. And, and one of the myths is that the myth that there's good people and bad people in this world. He calls it the myth of us versus themism. We tend to see it as like there's good people and bad people in this world. What does the gospel do to that? We're all messed up. Who's the good people? Right? Neuroscientific research actually supports this. I find this incredibly nerdy and fascinating, right? This guy, David Eagleman, he did an fMRI study. How many of you guys have had an MRI, right? It's like a, a magnetic resonant imaging. Functional magnetic whatever imaging is actually, they, they put the, 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 the electrodes on your brain, and it basically like, it like studies what your brain is doing, how your brain is responding in different circumstances, so they did this to tons of people, and the study was, they, 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 they had these cameras, and they thought there was people in the next room being tortured. And so they were watching people suffer. And then they were, they were, they were looking at, at how, how is their brain, like, are they being empathetic? Are they being apathetic, right? What's going on? Before they uh, exposed them to the suffering, they, they did this whole work where they would, they, would, they would make them feel like this person is really different than you. This person is from a category you see as a hate group. And then some of them, they would do, this, this is like, this is one of you. When they would do that, when it was somebody that was this, that you identify as this as being one of us, their empathy neurons would go through the roof. When they didn't, Nine times out of ten, the, 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 there was just a ton of apathy, like barely any trigger. Isn't that weird? Isn't that cool? Now, the thing is, is they were saying, because they don't want to get canceled, yeah, oh, I'm empathetic to everybody. 
No, but the, the proof was, the lie detector test was, was showing the truth, right? And what he, what he realized was, we have greater empathy for those we see as us. We have great apathy for those we see as them. Jonathan Haidt also wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion is kind of the, the idea. And he has this, this, this idea in this book where he calls uh, uh, the tribal switch, right? Going into tribal mode. Or you think about like beast mode. What put you into beast mode? What put you into tribe mode? And what he realized was that there are actually uh, 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 there, there are ways, there are techniques where people can influence us into, into a tribe switch, can draw us into seeing ourselves as, 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 as part of their, the us, the tribe. And almost always, it's, it, the tribe, the main, the main idea of the tribe is who you're against. Like recognizing who, who you're against. And so what he's done, this whole study, I won't, I won't go into all of it, it's fascinating that there's actually techniques that are being used in what one of my professors called to make us drunk on CNN or to make us drunk on Fox News, there's actually techniques being used that they study and they employ to get us all into these like, into tribe mode. The Bible says be sober-minded. I don't think that's what it has in mind. One of the things he realizes is that uh, uh, that that we basically begin to make our moral judgments based on our loyalty to these groups that have, have, have gotten us into, into tribal mode. When we, when we identify strongly with a particular group, he says, our moral reasoning tends to align with the values and norms of that group, and this can lead to a biased judgment and an increased polarization between groups. If they can convince you that the other group is the problem, then you, you aren't paying attention to any of the problems in your own group. That's what they found. He identifies strategic ways, a whole list of them, that government leaders, groups, can manipulate groups of people to rally together into what he calls tribalism mode, which is us versus themism. Basically, he says, when the tribe switch is activated, We bind ourselves more tightly to the group. We embrace and defend the group's moral matrix, and we stop thinking for ourselves. Or from a gospel perspective, we stop allowing the Bible to transform and renew our minds, and we are giving that discipleship process over to the media outlets that we sit under as their disciples. Are we being discipled by something other than the gospel. I think that's an important thing for us to ask. Tribalism, us versus them, aligning ourselves in a group over who we're against, particularly when it's not simply the gospel. And if it is the gospel, then we don't have an us versus them. So you could, you're not being formed into us versus them with the gospel. If you have a us versus themism, and you're calling it gospel, I would say there's a problem. There's a problem, right? And there are people in the church doing it. I, I probably myself too. Like we call it fighting the good fight. Somehow I'm fighting the good fight. That's not the gospel. I would argue that's not the gospel that Paul is presenting in Ephesians two. And the 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 easiest to recognize. Tribe switches are here. Here are they: fear, greed, and sympathy. H- how is some group trying to stir and get you afraid, using fear to bind you into their group? Because if I can get into the group, then I'm safe, right? Come here, we're, be one of us. We'll, we'll fight against the problem, right? Using fear. Using greed, right? How, how are they using greed? It becomes like, oh, if you, if, if you let them in, they're going to take all your everything, right? 
And maybe there's other issues, but that's not the way we should be motivated. Amen? No, no longer is the Bible, like, what does the Bible say about that? We're just listening and reacting. It's tribal switch. And sympathy. I mean, think about all of the, the rallies where we don't even know what we're protesting anymore, just, but they got our sympathy somehow. Like, I got to be a part of this group because they did this. And we got to, you know, on, on all sides. The gospel stands in contrast to this type of worldly operation, I think is the point. So in conclusion, again, we want to recognize us versus them attitudes. We want to bring these attitudes to the cross. And we want to embrace new life in Christ where we're us for them, for the gospel, and for the glory of God. Amen? And so... Up front here, you'll notice I have a little, a couple pieces of paper and a pen. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. I'm going to pray for us as the worship team gets ready. And I want to invite you, as an act of obedience, if the Spirit is stirring in you like the Spirit has been stirring in me this week, and you, you can recognize some us versus them hostility in your heart. I, I told you, I have... I have three people personally that I need to take even a bigger step than writing them down. I need to actually reach out to them and humble myself and be vulnerable and enter back into that space. Rather than waiting to see them at Costco or, or, or threading that day, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the appointment and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go towards it, right? Maybe you have somebody like that. Or maybe it's a bigger picture. Maybe you recognize, like, I, I, I really identify with this group, and we have a definite them. And Jesus loves them. That's my point. Like, you should love them. And if you don't, bring it to the cross. And ask, you don't, you don't have to agree with them. Love them. If, if I was the... Put on the, 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 the fMRI. I want, I want compassion and love when you think about them, not apathy. And that can only happen if we do the work of bringing it to the cross. And so I want to invite you to do that. What we'll, we'll invite you to do is we're worshiping. You can come down, grab one of these. You can write it down, put it in here, or you can take it back to your seat and hold on to it if you need to work on it a little bit. When we take communion, which we will, you can put that back in here then. Or if you need to just take it with you. Whatever you need to do with it, if this is your exercise, but take a step is my point. Heavenly Father, this stuff's hard. Being a new human, a new way of being human in Christ is hard. The early disciples had a hard time understanding what you were doing. When I read through the Gospels, it's more clear now because we have the whole picture, but there's still so much that I need to learn. And there's so much that I need to be shaped by. There's so much I need better understanding of. And I just pray that that would humble us. That we would recognize how much we're still in need of you. And that we would be more compassionate to all the others out there who also just need you. You're the answer. You're the remedy. They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy. Forgive me for having enemies and letting it stick in my heart. I want to love what used to be my enemies and I want to, I want to have compassion for them. I want to be willing to die for them. Whatever needs to come to the cross this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our room, in our, in our community, in our church, that we would do the actual work of obedience this morning and let you change us by repentance, by, by allowing you to renew our mind and walking out of here with different mindsets, with different, with different views that are shaped by your gospel. And may this not be confused with watering down the gospel. May this be the work of the gospel that changes lives one person at a time, one issue at a time just like you're changing me and just like you're changing us. And so we just pray that you would do this work this morning and help us to enter into it with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.